On October 25th, South Korea's finance minister Hong Nam-gi said Korea would not further pursue benefits given to the developing countries. Seoul's decision came just three months after U.S. President Trump stressed in July that some developing countries are taking advantage of trade benefits that come with the status. Developing country aims to improve its economy as it experiences lagging advancement in industrialization and economic development. There are no specific standards that differentiate developed countries and developing countries. But the IMF classifies the status of each nation depending on its GDP, level of regulation in trade, financial openness and others. Developing countries can receive around 150 benefits in the WTO negotiations. South Korea has been a developing country since joining the WTO as one of the founding members in 1995. In 1996, Korea decided to retain its status as a developing nation only in agriculture and climate change sectors. The U.S. said a nation that is either an OECD member, a G20 member, a high-income nation or accounts for a considerable share in the global trade should not be recognized as a developing country. The Korea Institute for International Economic Policy said 35 nations fall under at least one of four criteria. U.S. President Trump mentioned 11 countries, including South Korea, should no longer receive preferential benefits in trades. So far, countries including Singapore and the UAE have declared to drop their developing country status moving forward. Some pointed out the U.S. has brought up the issue of the developing nation status to take shots at China. But Washington's counterpart in ongoing trade war has reportedly decided to retain its developing country status. Meanwhile, local farmers are extremely concerned over Seoul's decision to not seek the trade benefits. The South Korean government, however, assured the farmers it would increase the related budget to support their businesses and protect their profits. Hello, welcome to The Point. I'm your host, Daniel Chen. South Korea will no longer seek privileges provided to developing nations in the WTO negotiations, a major decision that could impact select sectors, namely the agriculture industry. This is our topic for today. We'll have in-depth discussions with a number of experts from inside and outside of the nation. So, let's get to The Point. And to help us dissect today's topic into digestible bites, we're joined by Kim Byung-ju, Professor of International Studies from Hangul University of Foreign Studies and a regular contributor to Arirang TV. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Thank you. Well, first of all, Korea will no longer seek benefits given to developing nations by the WTO. Could you start things off by telling us what having a developing nation status entail? Right. You know, international organizations, because they include so many different countries, uh, they often adopt the principle of differentiating status. And when WTO was launched back in 1995, because this is economic issue, level of economic development really mattered a lot. And uh, there was a big, big voice coming from the developing country side saying, we cannot be treated like developed countries. And uh, the treatment for us or conditions we should face should be differentiated from those that developed countries face. And so what the, the result came out was that, okay, we're going to adopt the self-declaration principle. And what that means is countries can say whether they are developing or developed country status. They can declare by themselves. And Korea happened to have declared that we are developing country status. We are taking developing country status in agriculture. So. Uh, that remained in place for quite some time. And of course, there are reasons, right? In Korea, the agricultural uh, sector has very strong political power. And we have our nas nationalistic tendency in wanting to 
uh, you know, protect developing con uh, the agricultural sector. That's a national consensus. So that uh, played out as a factor to keep this in place for a long time. But now new changes come, and that's why we are saying, uh, the government is saying that we are going to no longer seek the developing country status in the future negotiations. And that's, that's what this story is all about. So what are some of the key uh, reasons the government made this decision? Mm -hmm. uh, observers of the news flow would say Donald Trump is the figure. Uh, I guess it was around what uh, July, I suppose. He began talking about the, uh, the I mean, for a long time he'd been talking about the relevance of WTO. Sometimes he often criticized, criticized saying that WTO has unrealistic classifications, developing developed countries and so on. But that past July, he, I think, began specifically mentioning this, uh, you know, uh, the status uh, of different countries, particularly with agriculture as it applied to Korea's case. Korea was being mentioned and so on. So uh, that's where everything began. It has uh, different stories behind it. For instance, what he had actually in mind was pressuring China buying, uh, by asking countries to give up their developing country status, which China was included in. So that's one of the reasons, that's immediate uh, cause. But behind that, of course, Korea for a long time, I worked in the trade ministry for many years, and when I was there, we, we could sense this kind of international uh, gaze or attention, uh, kind of saying, why is Korea a developing country? And so, uh, one way or another, I think we had to change our status, and this was the momentum in many different ways. And we have had paid costs for, uh, you know, having to maintain the status, and it's time a lot of people realize that we let it go, with or without Trump's call. Right. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at some of the criteria laid by uh, the man who initiated or provided the jump start to this transition, President Donald Trump. He laid out a criteria on developing country status, so let's have a rundown of the details. Mm -hmm. So what is there for Trump to gain by uh, making a fuss about the privileges of developing nations? Uh, what Trump suggested is an interesting thing. It's sort of like out of blue. I'm sure American uh, government officials worked hard on it, but there are four different categories, right? And uh, this was presented when Trump began uh, pressing on this idea of getting rid of or driving countries out of the developing country, country status. Uh, countries that belong to OECD members, countries that belong to G20 membership, and then countries that have been classified as high-income countries according to uh, the World Bank criteria, and then the fourthly, countries that are accounting for at least 0.5% of total global trade. Uh, so the countries have those four categories applied to them, they should give up the developing country status. And Korea happened to be one country that falls into this category. There are other countries that fall into three out of two, four or two out of four uh, categories, but Korea is the one that actually where all these four conditions apply, so we have to let it go. That's how rational it goes. Right. Uh, let us extend a conversation to another expert that's joining us at this hour. Time now to look into how the U.S. feels about Korea's recent decision. We have Timothy Webster, professor of law at Western New England University, joining us via Skype. Welcome to our program, Timothy. Hello, and thank you for having me on again. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to have you with us. Well, South Korea decided not to seek special treatment status for developing countries at the WTO for the first time in 24 years. What is your reaction to this? Sure. So my reaction is congratulations. Uh, by any economic or development indicator, Korea is a developed country. It has a high... GDP, it's comparable to New Zealand or Spain or Israel. Uh, it has the world's either 11th or 12th largest economy. Um, and if you look at the U United Nations Human Development Index, right, which is a sort of composite of a number of different indicators, life expectancy, income, schooling, um, Korea ranks 22nd in the world ahead of France, Spain, and Italy. So I think it's actually quite appropriate that South Korea now accepts that it is a developed country. Professor Webster, the U.S. was the biggest influence for Korea's uh, decision recently. Uh, President Trump said in July that the WTO developing countries should be stripped of the privileges. What do you think about his remarks? Sure. So with, with the president of the United States, you always have to differentiate substance from form, right? Or as he would say, style from substance. Um, and let's be clear, the president is a bully. He uses humiliating language. He uses mockery. 
Uh, he uses humiliation with his political opponents and with foreign heads of state, right? That's one of the reasons that he's in trouble with Ukraine right now. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily approve of his tone, um, but on this narrow issue, this narrow issue of designations for the World Trade Organization, I think he's actually right. Um, the WTO does not have standards as to whether a country is developing or developed. Uh, that's a decision the country gets to make for itself. And as we've said, there are a number of privileges that you enjoy as a developing country in the World Trade Organization. So um, when, when President Trump made that announcement in July, um, he called out a lot of countries that are actually quite wealthy, um, including South Korea, but also Singapore, Hong Kong, United Arab Emirates. Um, and these are among the richest countries in the world. So I think he's right to actually call out and say, wait a minute, you know, how can you really in good faith consider yourself a developing country when you are richer than most of the other countries, including most of the developed countries in the world? So I think he actually has a good point on this narrow issue about designations. And Trump would also want China to make the change, but Beijing disagrees. What's uh, Trump's likely reaction and follow-up move? Sure. So a couple of ways to answer this. So first, China and Korea are very different countries, obviously, right? Um, Korea is heavily dependent upon the United States for its regional security. Um, and I think Korea has also been more pliant with the United States on trade issues, right? So. In 2017, President Trump said, oh, we're either going to terminate or renegotiate the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, or CORUS. Um, and I was quite surprised at that. Um, but to my surprise, uh, Korean negotiators actually went ahead and did that and said, OK, you know, we will actually follow, you know, we are the, the rare country that will actually go ahead and follow you on this, President Trump. And within a year, there's actually a renegotiated treaty. Um, and I think that might be the right approach for a country, for a smaller country and a country that's reliant upon the United States like South Korea is. Um, but, but China is not in that position, right? China is a major economic power. It's a global power. It does trade all around the world. Um, and it has been you know, much less tractable on these trade issues than, than Korea or Mexico or Canada. Um, and so I don't think China is going to give up its developing country status anytime soon. Um, you know, for political reasons. But also, I think when we look at the economic realities behind it, uh, China is not a developed country. Sure, it's the world's largest or second largest economy, depending on how you on uh, how you measure it. Um, but it also is relatively undeveloped in many areas, right? There are tens of millions of Chinese who live in poverty. Um, the per capita GDP in China is around $10,000, um, about, you know, less than one third of South Korea's um, and if you go back to look at that human development index that I talked about earlier, where Korea was ranked 22nd, um, China is ranked in the 80s, I think 86th, right? So it's, you know, it's less developed in Sri Lanka and Thailand and Algeria. So I think also as an empirical matter, you can make a strong case that China is in fact a developing country, uh, even though we think of it as this huge economic powerhouse. When you break it down person by person, it's actually a middle income country. All right. Thank you, Timothy, for your insights and time. We appreciate it. Sure. Thanks again for having me. I look forward to our, our next conversation. South Korea is one of the founding members of the WTO when it was established back in 1995. It joined the body as a developing nation, but it no longer wants to maintain that status. Here's a clip showing how Seoul came to that decision. As Seoul decided not to seek trade benefits given to developing countries in the future WTO negotiations, attentions are gathered on how South Korea became the developing nation in the first place. The WTO has been rewarding preferential treatments to developing countries to allow them to be a part of the international free trade system. It allows each member to decide whether it falls under the status of a developing country or not. A year later, when Korea joined the OECD in 1996, South Korea has re-evaluated its status and has been since subject to preferential treatment in only two areas, agriculture and climate change. Amid the growing controversy over which countries should abandon its developing country status, Korea decided to voluntarily forego all of the benefits given to the developing countries for the first time in 24 years. Professor Kim, when uh, South Korea joined the OECD back in 1996, why did it decide to maintain the developing nation status only in agriculture and climate change? A very simple answer to that, uh, domestic politics. 
Agriculture, as we mentioned before, uh, has a very strong domestic political base. Uh, in, uh, these are all, all the numbers, but uh, 20 years ago when I was working for a trade minister, the number that I have kept since then is like uh, uh, agricultural uh, population is less than 10%, but they produce less than 7% of GDP, but they were represented at the National Assembly over 60% because of these districts. So a uh, politically very, popular, uh, very powerful segment of the society, agriculture, they ha have uh, argued for maintaining the de developing country's status, therefore protection for it. And then climate side, it's opposite side of spectrum, it's industries. Korea's powerful industries like Chebel and big companies, they were aware of the cost that's coming uh, when if Korea somehow accepts the responsibilities for climate change cooperation. So they were opposed to that idea. So, uh, big business on one hand, on the climate side, and then uh, very political, po politically powerful agricultural sector on the other side, on the agriculture. That's why we remained in 1996 when we joined the OECD. Uh, we, we, we kept, uh, we got, we secured the developing country status, and then we kept uh, that status since then. Right, South Korea was protecting its agricultural goods to the best of its ability, for instance, by, like you mentioned, imposing heavy tariffs on related products. Uh, we've prepared a chart on this particular uh, topic. Mm -hmm. We have the specifics. Let's take a look. Uh, how high exactly was the tax rate? Yeah, uh, let's take a look at the numbers here on the screen. For instance, the rice case, I guess, uh, you know, the tax rate is 513%. Garlic's case, I guess the tax rate is 360%, and onions case, 135 and then dates, 611%. So these products are, these are a short list of uh, these products, but there is a, actually a much longer list of the agricultural products that have been protected by this high tariff that have been allowed by the developing country status. What are some of the immediate concerns, as in the immediate repercussions once the changes are implemented for the agricultural industry? Right. In the future, if our declaration of no longer uh, developing country enters into effect, in that case, Korea can no longer p uh, keep these kind of high-level tariffs in place. So what that means is foreign products, foreign agricultural products will come in in much lower price and uh, likely many of them will come in with, with a much lower price than domestic price. In that case, consumers will buy those foreign products, meaning that Korea's farmers will probably lose their market share. That's a big concern. And also, Korean government's uh, ability to offer subsidies will be limited as well. So the farmers will have to get less cash in the form of subsidies, even though there will be other means available to make up for them. Mm -hmm. uh, let us extend the conversation further to another guest expert who is joining us. Uh, we will be connecting to another Asian country that has an um, experience similar to Korea. We have Wakas Adenwala, Asia Analyst at the Economist Intelligence Unit, joining us. Hello, Wakas. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you so much for being here with us again. Uh, what is your take on Seoul's decision on the WTO status? Um, I think it's fairly uh, a good decision on line with the world standards if you think about it. Uh, obviously, South Korea is part of the G20. It's part of the OECD economies. It's, after all, a high-income country and has a fairly big share of global trade. So, yes, it's uh, about time that South Korea did this. Uh, but also, to be fair, the recent decision was made more from a pressure from U.S. President Donald Trump, who has been pressuring a lot of countries globally to actually revoke their self-declared status of being a self-developing country as part of the WTO standards. So this is more in line from U.S. pressure rather than South Korean dynamics, because uh, obviously Donald Trump believes that a lot of countries are taking overdue unfair advantage of being considered as a developing country status, a developing status country, and then obviously that means that they can be um, qualified for certain exemptions on certain trade barriers, trade restrictions. Professor Adenwala, Singapore has made a similar decision in the past. What are some of the key reasons behind it? Uh, Singapore's case is slightly more different as well. Obviously, it's a high-income country. Uh, but it is obviously not part of G20 or OECD. Uh, but again, it was one of the few economies that was singled out by U.S. president. So obviously it doesn't want to be in the crosshairs of actually um, getting being on the wrong side of the U.S. at the juncture when 
global trade has already slowed down. And obviously, Singapore is a small city-state economy. It's very highly exposed to global trade. Uh, in fact, exports and imports are its very primary sectors. So uh, obviously, any further restrictions from the U.S. or any further disagreements also with the U.S. could cost very dearly to the Singaporean trade infrastructure. And that's something the city can't afford to do at this moment, especially when the growth is slowing down. So how would the change in status affect the country, both domestically and globally? And how should Korea and Singapore prepare for the coming changes? So if you think about the privileges that countries get up by being considered or self-declaring them to be a self, uh, developing states countries. Um, you see, what this allows countries is slightly longer timelines in implementing some of the requirements of WTO states. Countries should be adopting while the participants of global trading infrastructure. So obviously, South Korea and Singapore will not be qualified to benefit from extended timelines in implementing those restrictions. Secondly, these uh, statuses allow countries to protect the domestic industries. So by protecting domestic industries, you could often use subsidies to support homegrown industries. So in South Korea's case, um, the reason why it did not uh, you know, give away its status for so long was to protect its agricultural industry. Uh, that's obviously going to be the only and primary sector which is going to suffer in South Korea in the short term because they will be obviously uh, you know, facing competition from global agricultural uh, sectors from various parts of the world. So, yes, in the medium term and long term, I don't think South Korea and Singapore both will face any major restriction or hindrances. It's just in the short term and also primarily just South Korea's agriculture sector that will be obviously facing uh, some hindrances. But in the long term, actually, it's better because better global competition only leads to more competitive advantage. So it will only be a place for South Korea's agriculture sector to innovate better and move further up for the high end of the value added chain. Uh, thank you, Wakas, for sharing your valuable insights with us. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much for having me again on your show. Looking forward to having you again someday soon. Coming back to you, Professor Kim, uh, it looks like the decision we made, uh, it w we want to see a drastic change immediately. We have a transition period. Uh, how do you see some of the changes coming in the foreseeable future right. after we've made this announcement? Right. I guess this question itself is potentially one of the most important questions of today's discussion because uh, you, you mentioned transition, but uh, it's difficult to actually pin it down as a tr even transition because this is all for now, the way I see this, it, like, it's more like hypothetical rather than traditional because we don't know when this is going to happen. Korean government has uh, declared its decision no longer seeking the status of developing country. But when does this apply? When you ask that question, nobody has an answer. Because uh, as, as I mentioned before, ever since 2001 at the WTO, there has been new round of ne no, no new round of negotiations. So for close to two decades, we have been no table set up to discuss this kind of stuff. And we don't know when a new table will be set up. There's absolutely no uh, idea about it. So the government has, took, uh, has taken pain to emphasize that this is not Korea is, has, declaring, has declared foregoing of the status right now but whether it has de declared that it's no longer seek the status when there's a new round of negotiation. So uh, the timeline here is very important. It's an announcement that has been made without anyone's having no I any idea about when it will take actual effect, which means until it takes an effect, which we don't know when it will be, Korea remains in developing country status in agriculture. There's a nebulous notion of time frame for us. Uh, of course, right. uh, it will be different at the time. Some will feel there's too much time that we can take our time. And others, perhaps those in the agricultural sector, feel like it's an immediate danger. They might be looking to the government to come up with some protective or preventive measures against uh, especially American uh, imports. Right, right. And the, uh, what we can say is uh, there's a big gap between what uh, farmers want and then government can provide. But uh, since you're asking question about the the, the farmers probably demand on this. They have made specific several demands so far on this particular decision. They said the government should set up a special kind of committee to produce long list of future measures in dealing with this kind of change coming up. 
and that committee should be headed by the prime minister. That's number one. Number two is they have asked to increase the portion of agriculture-related national budget to 4 to 5 percent. And uh, that's a pretty big share within national budget. And also they said uh, Korean government should come up with a new ways of compensating the income of the uh, farmers, people in the agriculture. And uh, they have asked for other increases of different kind of found foundational uh, foundation funds and different kind of programs to support uh, farmers' uh, income. So there's a long list. But uh, those of us who have been working on liberating and opening up Korean uh, economic, uh, the industrial markets of different sectors so far, uh, the, in their eyes, what they've seen is Korean agricultural sector coming up with their demands for bigger package every time there is such move of opening the market, such as major FTA, like FTA with the United States, FTA with the EU, and FTA with China. Every time there is a, such big measures, farmers have been asking big bundle of compensation. So they see this as a kind of continuation of that pattern. Right. If you've experienced uh, uh, farm life uh, for even a few days, you understand how challenging and tough it is and why it is understandable they need some uh, degree of support. Right. Uh, this is where we have to wrap things up. Unfortunately, Professor, we'll have to let you go. Thank you so much for coming in and making our program complete today. Thank you. With the decision to make a big change, there's a lot of work to be done, especially since Korea needs to devise plans to protect local farmers while making adjustments to be recognized as one of the most developed nations in the world. And that's all we have for you at this hour. Do join us again same time next week for a brand new episode of The Point. Thank you for watching.